In this video, we are going to talk about two by four floor trusses and some of the problems you could run into if you are putting a stairway or a stairwell, some type of a section in the floor that uh, would require different size trusses. The first thing I wanna point out is that if you order a specific size truss, it usually cannot be cut, can't be cut down. Uh, this is actually a response to a question someone sent in. They found a 24 foot truss that is trimmable up to six inches. You can actually trim up to six inches off of the truss. Um, so this would actually, you could build it for a 23 foot six um, foot wide building. So trusses, if you are going to design a building with a stairwell usually need to be designed by the manufacturer or an engineer. You cannot, like I said, just chop a few feet off of them. So let's go ahead and look at how to give you an idea of how it's built. Floor trusses with some blocks and of course the floor truss. Now something that I just want to point out to kind of make sense, you know, if you have a, the end of the floor truss and it's all designed like this, you would actually think that you could just cut it right here and then make the end of the floor truss the same size. But again, um, that might not be possible. So again, floor trusses like these need to be, if you have a drawing, you bring the drawing in to the manufacturer and they will provide you with the exact sized um, joist for your particular project. Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. We have the full length 24 foot trusses and then we have shorter trusses. If we have a three foot wide stairwell then these would need to be a little bit smaller, maybe three foot six if you have two by six walls and the trusses of course will need to be smaller. The wall that the trusses sit on would now be a bearing wall. And if that's the case, you are gonna need a foundation underneath it. Go ahead and take a look at this. This might actually need to be a doubler or a beam in some cases. So, or, or this floor truss might actually stop here and then a beam would be installed here. But again, this is something that the product manufacturer would provide you with. Just like roof trusses, floor trusses like these are designed specifically for that particular project. Um, you might even need a doubler underneath the truss to take some of the weight off of it. Another section view of it here. The footing that would be underneath the wall. And of course you can see it right there, give you a better idea of the footing that, remember low bearing walls require a footing. So if you're building a building like this, you're gonna need something like that. But again, this is something that the architect or the engineer will provide you with. Reason why I make a lot of my videos is because I understand people are not going to contact an engineer. Um, hey, I'm gonna do this myself. If that's the case, hey, guess what? Put the dang footing in, you're gonna need it. Here's another idea. You can uh, switch the direction of the stairway and you can see here where you can use more of the standard sized uh, joist if you, that you could purchase. And even with something like this, you might actually be able to cut something like this down or use some two by 12 or two by 14 because you can see that the span isn't going to be very wide or I should say very long so you could actually get rid of the trusses and again I'm telling you this for those people who are just going to do this on their own and they're not going to hire an engineer. A double floor, uh, a double truss for this. Single truss here with a beam sometimes you can use a truss again that would be depend upon the engineer. You would use top flange hangers most of the time. If you have a beam, you can actually use uh, side flange hangers. They don't need to be top flange, but if you're going to be attaching them to the two by four trusses, they're gonna to have to be top flange hangers. And the other side here, again, double uh, our hanger for the beam, and then uh, the hangers for the joist. Another view of it there. No wall here. If you had a wall here, then you could get away with a single floor truss probably. And um, the and again, you could probably have use a conventional beam here. You wouldn't need a 
floor truss uh, for something like that. And there it is. So stairways that run parallel to the joist uh, will require a little less effort, um, or I should say you'd be able to use more of the conventional uh, standard size joist that you could purchase from a lumber yard. And then this system right here could actually be just conventionally framed with two by 12 or two by 14, um, if that's the case. And, and you might even be able to use a six by 14 here. You know, hey, what, what size beam, find out what you need, get a, get a glue lamb or something like that. And then that way, the rest of the floor, you are gonna be using the trusses on this section right here will be conventionally framed with 2x14 and uh, maybe a glue lamb beam or a micro lamb or the LVL beam, something like that. Now let's take a look at what the individual actually asked me to provide them the information with in the email. They said they were not going to build a wall in here. And if that's the case, you could probably do something like this. Double floor truss all the way across, double floor truss all the way across, and a double floor truss here to support this. Now this, we did a lot of framing like this before, but again, this all depends upon the product manufacturer and the span of the floor joist. So if I was going to build something like this, like I said, I would contact the product manufacturer for more information so that they could provide me with specific sizes and, uh, and, and some, we used to get these doublers and they were, um, they were nailed together. They were already a tad, they would have the truss clip clips on them and uh, they were one solid piece. So if, if you're thinking, hey, I'll double up two of these, that might not work. You might actually need a specific, specifically designed doubler for something like this. I guess I just can't stress that enough is uh, like I said, I can't tell you how many times I come across to people that are asking me how to do something and you really do need an engineer for it. The tr We got a tripler underneath here, two, three, two by sixes. Um, you could, uh, might, re might need a four by six or you might need a six by six for something like this. And here's the footing I was kind of talking about. Might need a larger footing to support this because this is going to be a concentrated load now. It's not going to be something that's equally distributed throughout the, the regular uh, standard footing. Another view of it there. Again, top flange hangers are used for situations like this. And uh, another top flange hanger to support this. And as I mentioned earlier, or in the previous one, you might actually be able to do all of this with conventionally framed lumber, glue lamb beams, um, and then just use the floor trusses for the other section. Bottom view of it there. I always try and provide you with enough pictures, like, like pictures. And that's it for this video. So I hope it makes sense. Uh, I've already said it enough. I know that people complain about me repeating my uh, stuff throughout the entire project. Uh, you can stop the video right here. I have to say it again. Projects with two by four floor joists are usually designed specifically for your particular project. And uh, if you are going to design something like this on your own, um, good luck is all I have to say. Here's a question I received in the comment area on one of my uh, YouTube videos. And the individual wanted to know what part of a garage you could attach a eyelet to. Something where you could raise or something off the ground, lift heavy loads. And I don't recommend doing that. Uh, most of the building parts on a building are designed specifically to carry a load and they might be able to carry more of a load. You know, maybe it could lift uh, 200 or 400 pounds, but um, I couldn't tell you that. And I would hate to have you, hey, I'm going to attach something to my garage header here and or double up some of my ceiling joists and, you know, uh, lift my truck off the ground. I, I, I can't tell you that, you know, what, uh, what you would need for that. And it's not, wouldn't recommend it, but I can provide you with some information on what we did when we were kids. 
or at least when I was 16, I used to pull motors out of my car. We simply installed a 4x12 beam and we put it on top of the rafter ties and uh, attached it to the rafter ties so it wouldn't move. We didn't want it moving at all. And then we would simply put posts underneath the beam when we were lifting our the engines out of our cars and these posts could be removed and uh, we can just kind of zoom in here you can use some hurricane ties to attach the beam to the rafter ties or the ceiling joist and you can use just a piece of plywood piece of scrap wood and nail it to either the post and uh, or screw it to the post screw it to the beam and uh, just have it to where you can take the screws out and then remove the posts either way whether it's attached to the beam permanently or the post permanently and then you can simply unscrew these and remove the posts and get back to having your two-car garage so they have the posts run down to the concrete and if you look if you need a little more safety the, your posts may be there a little flimsy they're they're moving you can always brace them off somehow like this, and I did this every once in a while. I'd brace it off if I was concerned about the weight. But uh, most of the time, the post and the beams, um, they they didn't move. You know, as long as the beam isn't going to move and uh, you're working safely around the post. I mean, let's face it, if this post moves and uh, you have a lot of weight on the beam, a little too much to where this is supporting a lot of the weight and you're working around it, and it moves, um, you could have a problem. So I'm kind of throwing this out there. You might want to brace it off if you feel comfortable. Don't worry about it. If the ceiling joists or garage ties are running in the opposite direction, you can simply put the beam in and just put a 2x4 across or 4x4, whatever you feel like. Um, and I think I space these about three foot on center, but you don't need to. You can just have one at one end and one at the other end to where the beam isn't moving. We do not want the beam to move while you are lifting a heavy load. And like I said, we used to lift motors out with these. Um, and a lot of times I was lifting engines that weren't completely assembled. They would have the heads off of them. I was just putting the block in, the oil pan, all that was attached, and I would put that in. So I, I'm guessing maybe two, three hundred pounds tops. Um, you might need to go with a larger beam. Uh, my dad had a four by 12 in there and it did carry, you know, we did li uh, lift out whole motors, complete motors uh, every once in a while. But um, for the most part, they were, uh, the heads were off of them. Not all the parts were on it. And uh, kind of, you know, this was sufficient. If you're going to be lifting you know, um, a tractor up, let's say, you might want a six by 16 in here. And, um, you know, it might need to run across, you might need to double up some of the um, garage ties or rafter ties, you might need to make these a little stronger just to support the weight of the beam. So keep that in mind also. But I hope this gives you an idea here. Again, tie it to where the beam isn't moving. And, and you can always run these boards longer. These boards can always run all the way to across to the other rafter ties or garage ties, ceiling joists, whatever you feel comfortable with. And uh, then when you're done, get rid of the posts, leave the beam in the attic and um, wait for the next time. It's already there. You put your posts in and you're ready to go again. So anyway. Here are a few things you should know before enclosing a carport. And uh, you see this a lot. Someone goes in and they have a carport and they want to turn it into a garage and uh, or they want to turn the carport into some living space. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a garage will look like first. And this would be something basically like an enclosed carport. But I uh, just want to give you some uh, start with this regular conventional framing, roof rafters, a ridge. Um, you're probably going to have beams that you're going to be working with and not walls. Um, the walls will go underneath the beams in some areas. But the main thing I wanted to show in this part of the video is that exterior walls usually require a footing, some type of a footing underneath them. That's the main reason, main point I want to drive home here. 
and that the slabs for a carport might be separate um, from the footings uh, because they're not going to have any footings. Slab on a garage is usually poured after the footings are poured. Give you an idea there. Here's what a standard carport design might look like uh, post supporting some beams that would be supporting the roof rafters with some rafter ties and some footings and a concrete slab. Take a look at how the post and the beam might be connected to the house. If you have a carport connected to the house, you might have a situation like this. The top of the beam might actually be the same as the top of the walls. This just might plane right in to make the roof assembly a little easier. Footings, a separate slab. Um, you, most of the time when you have a slab like this with posts, the footings will be poured at the same time as the um, carport driveway. Um, whether or not they're going to be raised off the ground, that would be totally different most of the time. I, a lot of the older carports, they just have a post and they would have a footing and this would be sitting on top of the concrete and might have a bracket or something. It all depends really on when the, when the home was built. Standard conventional framing on this type, roof rafters with a ridge. You might actually have a supporting ridge, uh, a beam underneath here with another post down here. And I'm actually going to have another video. I will put a link to it at the end here of another something else that uh, inspired me to make this video was uh, someone who sent in a carport that was enclosed and I'll have more on that later. So don't forget to check the back of the video for that. So the main point here, reason why I showed you the garage exterior walls is the fact that most of the carport slabs will be sloping in one direction and they are not going to have any footings underneath them for exterior walls. Let's go ahead and throw some soil in here to give you an idea. Um, sometimes it's hard to I understand. I know what I'm looking at here, but you might not. Soil, um, carport slab. Here's a wall that's being built underneath the beam as part of the enclosure. Let's remove that again. And remember, if we're going to build a wall, we need a footing. We're going to have to have a footing underneath the wall. The size of that footing would be hard for me to provide you with. I am not an engineer. These models are just meant to give you some ideas of what you might need to do if you're going to enclose a carport. By now, you should have a pretty good idea what would be required structurally if you were to modify a carport. Another thing I'd like to point out is that some building codes require a minimum of one parking space, one garage parking space. So if you have a two-car garage, you might be able to enclose half of the garage, but you won't be able to enclose the whole garage. Um, tip number two, and this one here is very important, if you do not get a building permit, um, which I see this a lot, if you don't get a building permit and you get caught, you might need to tear everything apart and put it back to original condition. Keep that in mind also. And um, tip number three, last on the list here, will be that uh, I know a lot of people come in and they don't realize that there's a step down into the garage. You know, they, they might have a door coming from their from the inside of their house. I think that's what we actually have here is a door coming here into the garage. So there's a door here coming in and they're gonna keep the door and make this into one big room and, and there'll be a little step down. Uh, if, if you don't like the step down, you can actually, I should say sometimes you can just pour concrete right over the existing concrete to, to level everything out. But if it's something that you're going to be converting into a room and you want it to be flat, you want it to be level like the rest of the house, in some cases you might need to remove the slab and re-pour the whole whole uh, concrete uh, garage or the, the foundation might need a new foundation here. So. This video is a response to an email I received. Uh, the individual wanted to know if they could do some modifications to a building and if it was even safe. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I would assume to be the original structure through some of the videos that I watched. And that would be roof rafters sitting on top of a beam at the bottom. 
a ridge beam at the top supported by a post beam on the other side with some type of a post to post connection now first thing i want to talk about is this post to post connection thing it actually looks like it uh, might be doing something but it might not the way that the roof is built with the post this post is supporting this ridge beam so if you can imagine the post is preventing this from going down and if this can't go down it would be difficult for the beams on the outside to move i hope that makes sense if everything's built correctly roof sheeting um, you have seat cuts on the rafters and everything is attached correctly it'd be very difficult for these walls to move if this brace was not here um, if i built something like this um, I might not put the braces in here. I might not because uh, I really don't see any reason to have them. And I do understand that it looks like it's doing something, but in reality, it might not be doing a lot. So I hope that makes sense. Just another view of how I think it's constructed. You have a beam here sitting on top of a post that would be inside of a wall. Same thing over here, a post. Um, supporting the ridge beam that would be inside the wall. The other beam and post, same thing as the other side. And then over here, we just kind of give you an idea of what it might be. Now, I doubt, I don't think on, um, or I would doubt that uh, you actually have concrete coming up. I would imagine that the footings, hopefully if they are there, are underneath the concrete and the post is sitting on top of the slab now the footings here this is probably all we're going to have um, the slab will be sloping let's not forget that's not a flat slab most carport slabs are at an angle another section of it there now let's take a look at some of the modifications that were made and some of the modifications that can be made to that might be more helpful or helpful suggestions. So what we have currently is a wall that was built underneath the overhang. And one of the concerns was that the fascia, that it might actually create a leak, that the fascia, you just can't have the fascia board on top of the rafter. Um, on the edge you need some type of an overhang like you have at the bottom and that's not necessarily true if the fascia board is installed correctly and you do not have any water leaks on the inside you can't see any water leaks on the wood nothing's leaking on the ground then everything should be working fine and I don't think you would need to move this wall now what about moving the post we talked about that the post, I think I would just, just leave it there. It's um, even if you move the wall over a little bit, I think you could uh, um, you could make it work somehow uh, by building a little cabinet or closet or a bookshelf, something like that, um, or just simply enclosing the corner. But uh, if you move it, then you're gonna be modifying the building. And this could actually create problems um, if there's anything that ever happened to the building. Now, here's, here's something that um, you might need to consider also, that the, in, the beam might be engineered for the current span. Let's say the current span is 18 feet. Um, and if we move it over a foot, then we would change the span to 19 feet. And if it, just by moving this post over, it might actually require a larger beam. So if you change anything existing structurally, um, you could have a problem. So I say just leave it. Leave the post there um, and you can build a wall under the post or you can build a wall. Um, uh, really, you can build a wall a foot to, in this direction, two feet in this direction. It does not need to build underneath the post, uh, the beam, I'm, say, I'm saying, because it's already supported by the post on each end. So this is just showing you another view of the post with a wall underneath it. The bottom plate, kind of another view here. Ceiling joists, we were talking about flattening the 
room on the inside flattening the ceiling you could be done by two by six i would imagine 16 inches on center um, if you can tie them to the rafters that's always going to provide you with some extra strength if you have 24 inch on center roof rafters tie the 16 inch on center rafters every four feet connect them to at least one of the rafters you can uh, use a ledger nail a two by six to the framing studs wherever you put wherever you move your wall to and then use some hangers underneath the ceiling joists to support it and that would be it for your flat ceiling just kind of throwing showing you another view here and you're probably thinking wait a minute this is kind of weird the way it's constructed but this the this wall was not underneath the beam so it was kind of uh i don't i don't really know why they did that but uh, i'm sure they have their reasons so Something like this, again, might not have footings underneath it. Would you need a footing for the center wall? Probably not. Not going to be a load-bearing wall, and you have everything supported by the post. Um, something like this would require footings around the perimeter, wherever the walls are. But I understand that, uh, you know, it really is hard to argue with a building that's been, uh, you know, you have an existing carport that's been there for 30 or 40 years, and then people have modified it turned it into a garage turned it into a room and uh, there's no cracks no structural problems no footings underneath this stuff and it's kind of hard to convince people to put footings underneath them you know it's it might not be in their budget or um, you know again it's hard to argue with something that's been sitting there for so long without any problems and uh, you're I'm going to tell you to go in and put some footings in there In this video, I will provide you with a few examples on how you can connect a full gable roof home addition to a gable roof. This would not be a partial partial home addition. And uh, I'm going to try and make a few more videos and I will put the links to them. Uh, I'll, I will organize them on our website. Don't forget to go to our website, check out our videos. You would click on the remodeling tab and then go to the Home Additions tab. And there's where hopefully you will be able to find more information on how to connect a variety of different home additions to an existing house. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's put a slab in there. And uh, this could be, you know, I'm focusing on the roof here, but uh, gonna be throwing in the concrete slab here. Now, this could also work with a conventionally framed uh, basement floor or a subfloor type of framing also. So here we have a the footings underneath the slab for the home addition and of course the footing isn't going through because the joist would be going all the way across. And I'm not providing you with lumber lengths in here also. You would need to get that from an engineer. These are just examples that hopefully will give you an idea to uh, convey to the engineer on what you would like to do. First thing you would need to do if you have solid sheathing would be to remove the fascia board. If you have one by six or one by eight, some type of a decorative uh, lumber being used for the roof overhang, I'm gonna try and make another video on that um, and hopefully I'm going to make it uh, to where I can put a link here but if not again visit the website I'm going to try and box all this stuff up and tie it together so it can be easier to find so solid sheathing take the fascia board off I don't think there's going to be any need at all to take and remove cut back the fascia board cut back the sheathing or remove the outlookers. But this might not be the case if you have one by six or one by eight. All of this would need to be cut back so that the sheathing could tie in. You do not want to have roof sheathing and then uh, running this way, let's just say from left to right, and then end up with some type of one by six or one by eight that was used running in this direction it's going to be better to have the sheathing but the sheathing and uh, get rid of the one by eight and again hopefully I mean, that'll make more sense in another video 
probably leave the ridge like it is and everything there should be fine install your rafter and the rafter will be installed so that it is half on so that you'll be able to nail into the roof sheathing into the rafter now you might need to cut the roof sheathing back a lot of times I've seen or came across it myself where you remove the nails that are attached attaching the sheathing to the fascia board you end up damaging the roof sheathing if that's the case simply cut back an inch or an inch and a half whatever you feel like you need to and if that's the case you might actually need to remove some of the outlookers or cut them also so that the rafter will actually um, come uh, to where it can meet halfway on the roof sheathing and give you an idea of what it would look like at the top here let's go ahead and put everything together roof rafters fascia board ridge here we got a view of the rafters the ceiling joist outlookers fascia board fascia board tying in here ceiling joist the continuous full length and a lot of times the cut here on the on the fascia board this would probably be a back cut this way you just simply back cut this board, slide it in, and then nail it right back into the uh, into the rafter, which would just be a little bit over to where the uh, fascia board would have been, and everything should tie together fine. Outlookers, fascia board tying together, the gable studs, the roof ridge, another view of it there. And again, don't forget you can slow this down, stop it, uh, replay it to get a better idea of what's going on. Uh, ceiling joist tying into the roof rafter, that's a must. And uh, probably three or four 16 D nails going into it. Two nails, towing, toenails into the, into the top plates. A view from the inside here. The other corner, the other corner, don't forget to tie the plates in. It will require a strap, some type of a strap, usually a 48 inch long strap, a little overkill, but I am not an engineer, so I can't say that. And don't forget these videos are just to give you an idea on how to do this stuff. If you need more information, something that uh, might be missing, feel free to leave it in the comment area. I am going to make a part two video to this that is going to provide you with more information on how to tie the plywood in or use straps to uh, make everything blend in here, or should I say to make the uh, structural engineers happy. In this video, I will go over a few construction methods that can be used to create a footing for a post or a pier that would be used for some type of a repair underneath a subfloor, subfloor framing. This would be a floor framed instead of a concrete slab. And um, it, basically, these methods can be used for new construction as well as for repairs. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one here. This particular post base, the concrete here, is, um, and a lot of times it's 12 inches by 12 inches and 12 inches deep. That would be 12 inches into the soil. So don't just pour a 12 inch by 12 inch and have it sticking up six inches because that would only be six inches deep. So 12 inches into the soil, 12 inches wide is a pretty standard measurement for a single story home. And uh, but uh, again, I'm not an engineer. I'm just throwing out a few ideas here. You have a two story home. You, wanna, you might want to make it a little bigger. How's that for uh Bigger usually is better, especially with concrete footings. Just don't make them too big. So this here actually has a post base connector and a post to a beam connector. But these come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Um, but uh, they used to actually just build, I think I have a picture of it here. 
they actually used to just pour concrete and then have a piece of wood on top and then the post sat on top of that. And I've actually came to jobs before where none of this was nailed. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but uh, you know, it might have had one nail in and another nail in here. But the, some of these buildings lasted a long time and they're still standing up, so hard to argue with. Um, uh, you, you're probably going to want to have at least two inches here from the top of the soil to the top of the um, concrete here. Um, some some building inspectors might want to see or engineers might want to might want to see six inches, but um, again, that's hard to say. You come in and you make something like this six inches off the ground, you might not have enough room for all your connectors or your piers, um, especially with an 18-inch crawl space. So uh, that, that could be pushing it there. Just another view of the connector. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of the ways you can use. You can always assemble it this way. Um, dig your hole, put everything together, and then pour your concrete. Form, put a form around it. Um, you know, one stake, two stakes. You might need three or four stakes. I'll leave that up to you. You pour the concrete strip the forms and there you have it. Another method that can be used would be to um, form it up and then hang the um, post base. It would need to be supported somehow. You could do this in a variety of different ways depending on what you're working with. Uh, if you already have your beam in here and it's into place, why not do it with the method that we just that I just showed you. But if you aren't you don't have the beam in place. You want the concrete footing in with the connector before you start on your repair. And I understand that you need to somehow hold the post base in its proper position before um, you can pour the concrete. And I know a lot of people just come in and stick these things in after it's done. Well, sometimes you do that and they're off a little bit. You know, if you do something like this and you double check it, make sure it's in the right spot, then you're probably going to be a lot better off. Just another view of it here. You know, you would nail this to a couple of stakes, nail through the connector to the um, support board, and then have a stake at each end, and that might work. Pour your concrete, and there you have it. Now, what about using piers? They actually sell these at most lumber yards and home improvement centers, and... That's fine. If you want to use these, um, go ahead. I wouldn't. I would just. I would use one of the methods I already showed you. I like the column bases, and um, the connectors here. But uh, again, you might have already purchased these, or you might have existing ones you want to get rid of. Then this might actually work. So what you would do there would be to attach the. You can do it either way. You can pour the concrete, set the pier or hang the pier off of the um, post or off of the beam and then um, get it where you need it and then pour the concrete. But you're gonna need to make sure that you have enough room on each side. Here you can see that there isn't enough room. So a 12 inch by 12 inch footing might not be big enough if the bottom of your pier is 12 inches by 12 inches. I say that, but you could always pour the concrete set the pier. Um, I understand that would work just fine too. And that's actually what they did a long time ago. They would pour the concrete in the footings and then set the piers on top of them. And the piers really didn't um, go into the concrete. Um, they sat basically on top of the concrete and um, could actually be removed quite easily if, if needed. This might give you a better idea what I'm talking about, but in this one here, I raised the pier to set um, to connect to the po to the beam without a post, and uh, this right here might work out well for you too. You can always dig a footing and then set the set the pier, and if there's like an inch or two gap between the bottom of the footing or the top of the footing and the bottom of the pier, you can always fill that with concrete and just kind of let it spill over a little bit or form it up to um, work whatever is fine. But sometimes the piers, 
if you're making a repair and you've got the beams in place, you can hang the pier off of it, pour the concrete. If not, um, then you can. And, it's, and this, this is a good example of what I was talking about. If you get the beams in position where you want them, you can raise the pier up to the beam and nail it to the bottom like this. And this way you're not going to need two pieces of hardware. And then you can you can raise the footing as needed. Uh, if and and again, if you if you just did some math here, if this was a six inch beam and this is a twelve inch footing, then and we need an eighteen inch crawl space from the top of our joist to the bottom of the ground. That's where we would be. So if we have a twelve inch pier and a six inch um, six inch beam supporting everything then this would be all this would work out uh, quite nicely but if you poured the concrete and set the pier before putting the wood in you could be a half inch high or you could be putting shims underneath this and if you did do something like that make sure this is a little lower if you have a five and a half inch beam uh, make sure you have six inches here you can always put a piece of plywood underneath it or some filler but uh, it's not going to do you any good to start notching this stuff, especially if you're if you need a five and a half inch beam and you notch it down to four inches. That's not going to work. Not going to make anyone happy. So another view of it there, without the concrete footing, and there we have it. Here's an example of the beam with the post to beam connector and the post to base connector. And here are the screws I was talking about that will screw into these holes to attach everything together. And of course, these will nail together. So the beam, the post, building hardware, and the concrete footing. You can see this was probably formed with two by six, giving us about five and a half inches here, a nice distance from the top of the soil to the concrete here when it's all said and done. This is an example of how it connects together the post. And again, this right here, you're probably thinking, well, how this is kind of hokey here, you know? Well, this is what the engineer drew in. This is how tall the concrete is. And you can see that we really don't have much of a choice. That's the way it's going to get built. But either way, you get an idea of what the connectors would look like here. And uh, if you have longer connectors or longer posts, then this might uh, look a little nicer but uh, you know another thing I'd like to point out here and this is um, something that's obvious now that we can see it but uh, let me go back to the other picture make sure that you install the building hardware to where it's going to work if this post space would have been rotated 90 degrees to where the straps were on this side you can see where it wouldn't work very good so make sure that your building hardware is going to work especially when you're pouring it in concrete and you won't be able to turn it after the fact. Mm -hmm. And again, I hate to say it, but if you're doing a repair and you put everything together like this and then pour the concrete, um, you would have seen that mistake. Um, but afterwards, uh, you're not going to be, you might not see it. So um, like I said, it might be better to connect everything together and, so, you know, Connect everything if you can and then pour the concrete. But if you can't, at least make sure that the post base is in the right spot. You know, if you're doing a repair, could you simply cut this? Yeah, but again, that's extra work and that's not what you want to be doing. Here's the other connector we already went over. Here's an example of what the piers were years ago. You can see the block right here. Um, block simply sitting on top of a concrete footing give you a better idea. This actually looks like they didn't even form it. They just kind of put some concrete in here and then um, set the uh, piece of redwood here on top of it. And that was it. So, and like I said, I've came across these before where there aren't even any nails in anything. They just have it sitting on top of it. Hard to imagine, but that is the way it is in the construction world. So be prepared if you're working on a project to find, run into stuff and think, who in the heck did this? Well, somebody did it years ago. Whether they were drinking or not, we will let that one go there. 
here's a question that was sent to me this morning and actually going to make a video and put it on there today desperately need a stair video for my stair youtube channel uh, kind of running out of ideas but uh, we'll get on that later get some more videos going here with some more books don't forget to check out our books at the website homebuildingandrepairs.com click on the books tab and we have all sorts of books there on stair building and planning on putting more on there in the future. But uh, this particular stairway that the individual sent me, it kind of looked like it was in bad shape. The stringers are cracked. And the first thing I'd like to point out about um, using Trex is it is kind of a weaker material. And even the manufacturer, I, and I really recommend uh, checking out the installation um, procedure and I think they have it in a PDF just type in if whatever product you're going to use if you're going to use Trex type in Trex, Trex product installation um, instructions and it should pull that up and actually has a section on stairs using it and how, how to attach it to the stairs and some of the information I'll actually put in the video so um, it's kind of a weaker material if you have a stairway that's has three stringers in it. If you're building something new and um, actually got some information off the website and I agree with it, wouldn't be a bad idea to space your stringers about 12 inches on center for a Trex or an artificial um, product um, decking material. Some of these things are weak and um, you know the bulk of your um, the weight is always going to be on the front here, always going to be on the front, rarely going to be in the back. You know, you don't put your foot all the way back here and then step up to the next step. That's not real common. Most of the weight is going to be right in here. And if we can beef this up a little bit, then um, we could actually make a nice, strong stairway using these materials. So um, new construction wouldn't be a bad idea to use four stringers uh, or five whatever you need um, try try to space them less than 16 inches on center i don't advise going over 16 inches on center unless you're going to use some type of riser supports which i'll show you what i'm talking about there in a few minutes so um, that's first off new construction if it's old construction you're working with a existing stairway you might not be able to add a new stringer to it um, but uh, the manufacturer, I think, calls out for blocks like this. And, um, you know, I think this might work too, putting blocks at an angle here. Or, I mean, uh, putting them vertical instead of horizontal. But this is actually what the product manufacturer calls out for. And this right here, I think either one of these, um, and again, follow the manufacturer's instructions. I'm just kind of throwing this out there. Um, I like this idea. It gives you a little more nailing. Don't forget that if you're nailing the stringers, uh, maybe pre-drill holes, especially if your stringers are already damaged, pre-drill some holes through here so that you can uh, install the blocks. It's not uncommon to drive a nail into the edge of the stringer and just chip this corner off. And if that's the case, you could be opening up a new can of worms. So you might need to use some type of building hardware um, A35s, you might need something that uh, you can put in a corner and uh, uh, to make it easier to install the blocks without cracking the ends of the corners. You might need to install larger blocks. You might need 2x12s. You might need to get down here to get some more nailing or even some 4x6s, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. And, uh, um, and something like this right here, let me go back to this. You, if you're going to use the manufacturer's product, I know they sell like a one by six um, that's for fascia board and stuff like that. You're probably going to have to block the stringers because it's really not a structural component. It wouldn't be as structural as regular construction standard lumber. It's kind of a weaker product, so it might not give you the strength. If you're going to install um, for example, Trex decking materials for your treads and then use their 1x6 or 1x8 for your steps, um, you're probably going to have to block it. And again, the product uh, information, uh, installation information should provide you with um, more information on that. You might not need to block this if you're going to use um, regular construction standard lumber. 
Here's a stairway with two by eights. We have a seven and a half inch riser supporting the treads. And you can see here where this is a solid piece of lumber. It's going to give you some support to prevent the treads from moving. And uh, that is a big problem with the artificial materials, or at least it has been with my experience. Here's a one by, if you're gonna use a one by, that might be, that might be fine. Um, and I would imagine it would be if you used a one by eight, it's gonna give you the support you need for this. Um, or at least provide you with additional support. And, and again, this is what I'm talking about. If you're going to use the um, fascia board or the one by eight, one by um, six from the manufacturer of the same product you're going to use, you're gonna have to install blocks behind it most of the time, because that stuff's pretty weak. One more thing, the nosing, always check to make sure that the manufacturer of the product allows you to put a nosing on the tread. Um, on the step. It might not. You'll have to build something like this. But again, check, read the instructions, get all the information you can from them. They make the product. They work with it. They get to deal with all the problems. I don't. Um, so they're going to be able to provide you with the best advice um, most of the time. So anyway, that's it for the video. In this video, I want to provide you with a few ideas or things to think about when installing a room addition. You start with a particular floor plan and a roof design, and then when you alter it by putting a room addition in here, you could change the roof pitch uh, and change it in some ways that you might not expect. Now, what I'm going to show you here is I'm gonna put a room addition on the side here and a room addition on the back and provide you with a few things to think about when you are planning on locating the walls in a certain spot. You might be better to move a wall a foot in one direction to make the roof design a little more appealing or to make it a little easier to build. So let's start with this example here. We have 15 foot five inches here a 15 foot five inch span here and same here. As long as we have the equal dimensions here, our roof ridge is going to die into the roof ridge and they will be the same height. The minute that I change this, the roof pitch will change also. Here's an example of a equal span creating the ridge that would die into the existing ridge. So this, this span and this span is the same. Give you an idea here, 15 foot five inch width, and then a 15 foot five inch width creates a ridge height that would be equal. If I make this larger or this one here wider, this one here wider, it's going to affect the ridge design. In this example, I moved the wall to make it a little wider, and you can see right here where it has raised the ridge height, and it is not at, it's not the same height anymore because I made the room wider. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. I made this wider. You can see that the ridge is taller, and it's gonna change the design of the building. So I hope that makes sense. The minute that you change the width of the rooms, um, it's going to affect the ridge height and the roof design. In this example, I went ahead and put a room addition on and you can see where it has changed the roof design because I've increased the overall width of this uh, part of the house. So, this part right here can, all, can be altered. I could take this whole wall here and drag it in, and that's just going to move the ridge. It's gonna make the, it's gonna move the hips and just make this a little smaller. It's not going to change the height of the ridge. The ridge height is gonna be determined by the span um, on this side, not on this side here. Give you an idea. So let's go ahead and take a look at what it would look like in a different perspective here. So here we have the equal sided 15 foot 
five, I believe. And here we have changed the width. We've increased this because we put a room addition here, which raised the height of the ridge. Hope that makes sense. Haven't done anything here. Same 15 foot, five inches. Right here we have 15 foot, five inches. So this in theory, the ridge and this ridge is the same height. But this is kind of giving you an idea of how you can actually alter, change the design. I know a lot of people just grab a piece of paper and a pencil and they think, ah, the ridge is going to die right into there. It's not. When you add a room addition on and you're trying to get everything to blend in, you're going to need to factor in the overall span of the area you're working with and how it's going to affect the height of the ridge if you're going to keep the pitch the same. Now I could change the pitch. I could have this line, the ridge line come into here and then just take and just run an offset, um, a different, uh, wouldn't be a 45 degree, angle coming off of here for my hip I could just simply cut a board in here and cut all these rafters to fit in here and probably get something to work but if you're going to keep everything the same you're going to have to keep in mind that uh, the width of the span of course is going to affect everything now let's go ahead and pop something off the back another addition here's the one addition we have here see how the roof's working out and if we bring something off of the back the ridge is going to be lower because the span is smaller. If I change this to the 15 foot 2 span overall, then the ridge would die right into this ridge here. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this would look like in a three-dimensional view. So again, here's the one room addition on this side, the other room addition on the back, and you can see where the ridge is lower. The ridge is lower because this width isn't the same. If I made, if I brought this over at 15 foot 5 inches, I believe, then the, then the ridge would line up with here and the valley would come off. And then the hip right here would die right into the top where the valley would come off on the other side. This thing wants to just keep spinning. All I got to do is spin it. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And uh, this ought to give you something to think about when you are designing your roof uh, for a home addition. This video will provide you with information on how you can build a pretty solid, heavy-duty set of stairs, three-step set of stairs, um, three risers. And you could always use this for a four-riser situation if... Um, it uh, would work for you. So seven and three quarter inch rise, 11 inch tread, inch and an eighth plywood. It's gonna be about 32 inches wide. And uh, actually this video was inspired uh, because I someone sent me in a thing on my other stair building channel. They said uh, I built the same thing out of three quarter inch plywood. And someone said, hey, can a large hog walk up this thing? 450 pound hog, I believe it was. And I thought, now might be a good time to make a video on a heavy duty stairway. And uh, here it goes. So we're going to start with a piece of inch and an eighth plywood. Um, square edge, if you have tongue and groove plywood, you might need to alter some of the measurements, move some of this stuff around to make it work. Um, and I will provide you with measurements at the end of the uh, video because uh, I thought it would be better to get an idea how it's actually built. So you're going to cut your stairway um, into pieces. These will be the treads. This will be the tread supports for the risers. And this will be the um, second and the third riser, the bottom riser, the back, and of course the sides. Let's go ahead and start with the two sides in the back and we will fasten them together here like so. The back, uh, this can actually go on the other side. I'll leave that up to you. You would need to change the measurements on it. Um, we're going to put it in this way because a lot of times when someone's building a little stairway, it might be for a mobile home or a trailer um, or large farm animals for that matter. Um, 
it looks nicer to look at this side. And if we were to take and cut this and run it through, you would see um, kind of a line going down uh, the side where it intersects. And a lot of people don't want to see that. So, and you can nail these together with uh, 8D nails, I would imagine. You can screw these together. Um, what type of screws? I would say maybe a number eight. Um, a, a number uh, six might work. A number eight though, two and three quarters. That would be just fine. Two and five eighths, something like that uh, should work. And, uh, but I'll leave that up to you, uh, just as long as it attaches. And you can glue all of these components together too. Put glue on top of the uh, stringers over here, glue on to top of this. Wherever you make a connection, you can use construction, adhesive, or even regular carpenters, carpenter's glue for that matter. Um, fasten the lower riser to the uh, side stringers. And then you're going to need to attach the tread supports to the risers and again this can be glued and screwed together and they will line up with the top here this is our riser height seven and three quarter inches and I believe I made this about nine and a half inches it's a little bit longer you can make it ten inches if you want and you can make the tread support wider if you want also but this actually just provides us with, with a little more support and I don't see people doing this on stairs like this, but I really think it's a good idea, really, and especially if you're trying to make a stronger stairway. Uh, I've seen people put a just a regular three-quarter inch tread across this plywood, and uh, it moves in the center. So with this right here, you can put the support in here, and, and you're probably thinking, now oh, wait a minute, I can screw the tread to the back. Um, in plywood and stuff like that, or OSB, you walk up something like this, put enough pressure on it, and you're going to break the plywood. So this seems to be a far superior idea. So, But I'll leave that up to you. Now, my measurements will provide a gap here. If you want to, if you don't want a gap in here, um, go ahead and change the measurement. I believe I subtracted an inch and a half off of each side, just so the gap should be about three-eighths of an inch. The reason why I did that is not uncommon to cut all your pieces and go to nail them together and then find out that uh, this piece is a little longer and it's pushing the stringer out. Uh, so this might could save you a little bit of frustration if you want to line everything up and not worry about that. But I do understand there's some perfectionists out there who aren't going to want to do that. They're going to want to make sure everything is tight. Uh, nail the treads on or screw them on again and uh, you'll be able to put screws in the back uh, into the support and if you want you could always go under the stairway and put some additional screws there too um, but uh, I really don't think that'd be necessary for something like this you know I see sometimes people go in and they put screws in from the back of the riser into the tread not going to be necessary with the tread support here just providing you with a couple extra views here and there's your stairway okay let's go ahead and go over some of the measurements um, two foot eight inches 32 inches this, I just simply divided the sheet of plywood up into three sections it's an eight foot piece of plywood 32 inches 32 32 equals eight foot 11 inch treads 11 inch wide and the base and these are identical, so I'm not going to, I think I'm only going to provide you with measurements for this part here, but should give you an idea of what this is over here. And we are subtracting an inch and an eighth here. The inch and an eighth is for the riser. Once we put a riser on here, it's going to, uh, if we didn't cut this back, we would need a larger tread at the top here. So to keep all of our treads equal distance, we will need to cut an inch and an eighth off of our 11 inch um, top step. And again, I'm putting the measurements in the back. You can watch the video as many times as you need to. You go back, you watch the video again, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. So the bottom, here's the bottom riser, and then over here is the bottom riser. This will be the first step on this side. And then this would be the first step on this side. So you could always lay out this part right here and then simply trace it um, to the other side. But this should work out right here, doing it this way just fine. 
two foot seven and seven eighths roughly here. And again, these measurements are exact because I'm drawing it in a computer program. So um, if you're off a little bit, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, one foot ten and an eighth is going to be the overall height. Um, here's two foot eight inches again. This just goes straight on through our bottom riser, the second riser, the third riser, and then our tread um, supports that attach to the riser. This is the back. So two foot eight inches, two foot five and three quarters. Remember, we have to subtract um, two and a quarter inches from the from the width of the stairway to put this in the middle in between the two um, stringer supports here. So let's go ahead and go over some of the measurements again. I know I made a video on this with a three quarter inch stairway and I had to make another video because nobody could see the measurements. And if that's a problem, let me know. But again, I'm going to be telling you what they are. Two foot eight inches. This is the tread, 11 inches wide. Two foot seven and seven eighths inches bottom. We subtracted the inch and an eighth. This will be a scrap piece of wood we will get rid of. Um, hopefully you can see this one foot ten and an eighth. Um, it's not cut off in my video there. Um, two foot eight inches. Six and five eighths inches will be the height of our first riser. Two foot five and three quarter inches wide, um, one foot ten and an eighth inches tall. That's the back backboard. Uh, Eleven inches, two foot eight. Go to another piece here, and we will go over the risers here and some of our cutouts. So all of these measurements pertain to the risers and the tread supports here. So hopefully it doesn't get confusing one and three quarter inches. Remember this is seven and three quarter inch rise. This is basically where we come up with this. If you are going to make this 10 inches, just make sure that this is seven and three quarters um, inches right here or seven and five eighths would be fine. Uh, it's going to be an inch and a half in. If you don't like that and you want it to be an inch and an eighth, this is where you're going to change it. Um, change it to an inch and an eighth or an inch and three eighths maybe. And um, or I should say an inch and a quarter, and that'd give you an eighth of an inch if you did do it an inch and a quarter play at least. So this right here is where you're going to change it if you don't want the gap. Um, like I said, nine and a half inches. Yours can go a little longer if you want, depending upon how big of a tread support you want to attach to it. And these measurements are basically the same as they were on the other side. The strips are going to be two foot five inches, and again, you'll, you can cut them a little longer if you want them to be tighter. And uh, I made them about an inch and a half wide. You can always make these a little larger too. So one inch and a half um, tall, um, two foot five inches wide. Okay, our stringer, two foot seven and seven eighths, one foot ten and an eighth, uh, nine and seven eighths inches on the top remember we're going to put a riser on here and the riser here is going to bring this to 11 inches if we add an inch and an eighth riser to it seven and three quarter inch rise next next uh, step is going to be 11 inches again seven and three quarter inches rise there and then of course the last step is going to be 11 inches with a six and five eighth inch six and five eighths of an inch rise. Um, this will be the first or the bottom step. So anyway, that's it for this video. And